This talk is uh, on building compilers for uh, AI programming frameworks, which is an extremely uh, interesting uh, and challenging uh, area with lots of uh, opportunities. And uh, through my talk, I hope I can uh, uh, perhaps uh, give you a feel of uh, what we have today, uh, where uh, this field is headed, it, uh, and uh, other opportunities and challenges in this uh, area. Okay, so uh, make sure we uh, sort of refresh this. Uh, compilers, we know, are language translators that take uh, uh, translate programming languages to instructions that the hardware can uh, understand. So the first part of my talk uh, is uh, about uh, what compilers for uh, AI are and how are they different from the traditional uh, compilers, we think of C, C++ compilers, right? And why do we need new compilers or new compiler infrastructure? What is the current role of compilers in this whole uh, AI and high performance computing landscape? And uh, where are we headed? What do we need in the future, right? And uh, compilers are clearly one of the pillars of uh, computer systems. So when you think of computer systems, think of compilers, networking, databases, programming languages, operating systems. So these are all the, uh, the major areas and compilers is one of the uh, one of these key areas, right? All of these, all of the code that we see, right, from other parts of systems is compiled using compilers. We would like compilers to be reliable, uh, performant. Uh, would like to uh, reduce the programmer burden and so on, right? So let's take a look at how uh, compilers uh, evolved. So in the beginning, before there was open source uh, uh, internet and all of this collaboration, and people you have languages on the left side and basically hardware on the right. Each time you had a new piece of hardware, people used to build a compiler. So if I have M languages and N targets, right? If you do it naively, you will get basically M times N uh, compilers. And this is not a scalable approach, and people soon realize this. Uh, and uh, they realize that just like in computers and other areas of computer science, we use abstractions to solve uh, uh, problems in a scalable way. People realize that you need something uh, an intermediate representation, which I have called uh, IR over here, and that is reused across. This is all you need instead of building M times N compilers. Uh, you will just build a front end. Each time you have a new language, you build a front end. Uh, you have this common thing uh, in the bit in between IR, which is uh, language neutral, and then you add a back end, right? So if you have M front ends and then N back ends, right? And then the plus one is for the box in between, you get M plus N plus one compilers, right? Compared to M times N, from M times N, you go to M plus N plus. It's such a simple uh, idea, but uh, it's a dramatic reduction in uh, software engineering uh, complexity right? and uh, maintenance, et cetera. Right? And so this is the figure that typically textbooks show, but this is not really uh, the reality today. So modern compiler infrastructure like LLVM, they look more like this. Right? Uh, it's not a single, but they provide this LLVM IR. Uh, it makes it very easy to create new backends and uh, each time you have a uh, basically language, you, you need to find a path to take that language and, and convert it to LLVM IR, and then that's going to uh, uh, do a lot of uh, the optimizations. It's easy to add a backend. So again, it's uh, M plus N plus one, and except that, it also provides a lot of infrastructure to easily create a new backend. You don't have to basically reinvent the wheel, but you can just say, here are the things, here are my registers, here are some rules to map to those instructions, and uh, so this is the state of the art as far as general purpose compilation goes, right? So for languages like C, C++, Rust, all of these languages subsequently, they lower to LLVM IR and they are uh, compiled, right? And so LLVM has really solved a lot of the problems that were uh, very difficult, uh, especially in the early 2000s, and it's become an excellent example for an open source uh, uh, infrastructure that is modular, uh, reusable, and has really allowed people to build uh, new compilers, right? And however, notice also the green boxes here. Right? So I think the colors are not easily visible on the screen, but you have the languages, and then there are some additional boxes because LLVM is uh, low level. People often have the need to build their own intermediate representation. This is what has happened. This is what has happened for a lot of the uh, AI domain-specific languages like uh, TensorFlow, JAX, because LLVM is not sufficient. They add a new intermediate representation, they first do a lot of their optimizations over there before they lower to LLVM. So there are all these green boxes, and we are again back to the same uh, problem we had, I showed earlier, uh, M times N, right? If you have M frameworks and N hardware, ideally if you're doing it right, you'll get uh, M plus N uh, 
basically uh, things over there. But now with everyone building their own deep learning compiler and all of those efforts not sharing infrastructure, you're again back to the same problem you had in the 70s, 80s, uh, where uh, it is not scalable or modular, right? And uh, as a result, what has happened is that currently, if you look at the uh, landscape of AI compilation, and I'll explain that in the next slide, it is really being driven, all the heavy lifting is being done by handwritten libraries. So things like QDNN, uh, TensorRT's kernels, QBLAS, uh, Cutlass, uh, MKL, and all of these libraries have been written by experts, the specific uh, hardware vendors, and ultimately, whatever compilers you have in this space, they are trying to map to those libraries. Right? Uh, or when you say uh, there is the default torch, so the logos over here correspond to uh, different uh, deep learning frameworks. PyTorch is by far the more dominant model. All of them are Python based. Uh, JAX and TensorFlow are two other frameworks. Uh, and uh, the default uh, execution engines that come with these, they are relying on libraries, handwritten uh, code. Right? So because it has been challenging to build compilers for, th for these frameworks uh, up until maybe a few years ago, so the right tools, the right infrastructure wasn't available. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, we will see what the issues over there are. Let's look at this small uh, snippet of code. So this is uh, Python in uh, PyTorch. right? Uh, and uh, the computation here that is shown is one of the most important uh, computations that's driving uh, AI and generative AI. It's called the self-attention layer. It's used in all transformer-based workloads. So you don't have to understand it, but you can see that uh, there are a couple of matrix-matrix multiplications here. In between, there is a, a softmax and some basic math operations like square root uh, and uh, uh, basically uh, some point-wise operations in between, right? But it has two matrix-matrix multiplications. And this is a very compact specification which is very close to the algorithm. And today, if you take it in torch and then run it, right, uh, what will really happen is for each of those operators, it's going to make a call to a library. Right? So, so the compiler is playing a very limited role. The compiler has been used to compile those optimized uh, libraries, but when you actually execute, and that's how people are getting a performance from Python, the real code that's executing is not Python, but the torch uh, framework will take this thing and go through this whole, all these operators in the graph and for each operator, basically make a call to some library that's been written in C, C++, sometimes CUDA, sometimes even assembly, right? And your actual execution is uh, basically a composition of uh, calls to these libraries and not really Python. That's how people have got fantastic performance with these uh, Python-based AI frameworks. They're able to run this thing on GPU, they're able to run this thing on CPU, right? But now, what's the disadvantage of this uh, approach if you try to use too much of uh, libraries? Uh, basically, uh, what is happening here is that uh, you'll get locally optimized execution. That is, each of those operators is executed fast, but you're losing performance at the boundaries. And the amount of performance you would lose at the boundaries can be even two times or four times. It's not just 10, 15%, right? So because each of the operators you execute, data goes in and out of the memory, and we'll talk about it more. So there is that much of performance still left in the table. And that's where uh, compilers uh, come in, right? They can get that kind of a performance. And if the compilers are not there, what people will do is take this whole specification and write some really hand-optimized code in low-level models like CUDA, et cetera. Now, there are two uh, uh, important compilers or two major production-level compilers that are there in this space. They are XLA and Torch Inductor. But again, they have limitations on uh, what they can do with this kind of uh, code. And as a result, there is more to be desired uh, over here, right? So uh, the compilers in the space are still evolving. Uh, they are limited in many ways. And I'm going to talk about some of the uh, challenges that they have today. So uh, back to, uh, so whenever people uh, say uh, that uh, auto parallelization and all of that has been very hard, it has not been successful. I think there is a very recent paper uh, that was published at AS Plus 2024. I think uh, all of you should read it if you have already not. Uh, this is basically on the PyTorch 2 uh, compiler, and they're really showing the kind of improvement uh, compilers uh, already provide over non-compiled uh, execution, right? So this is, uh, they've really shown on this figure, if you look uh, closely here, uh, on, they've evaluated something like 180 models on the X, on the Y axis, there's number of models, and on the X axis shows how much speed up you can get with compilers, right? That is purely eager execution that is making calls to libraries. They've really shown that on really 150 or two, 170 models, right, out of the 182 models, you're able to get a speed up of more than 1.5x 
with uh, compiled execution. And uh, basically, at least on uh, something like uh, 50 or 60 models, you're getting a speed up of more than 4x. Same program, basically, uh, with compiled. So this is a cumulative distribution uh, function. right? So on the x-axis, you have the speed up. So uh, I think so we could say that the compilers are already here. They are doing auto parallelization. Uh, they are providing good speed up over uh, basically no uh, compiled uh, performance. Right? And so let's see uh, how all of this is happening and uh, how much more uh, opportunity we have over here. So when we look at the two sides, right here we have programming frameworks and on the other side we have hardware. I think uh, there's always work in compilers to do because both sides are evolving. Like languages, the frameworks are evolving, the new operators being added, levels of abstraction are going higher and higher. And then on the other side, the hardware is evolving. In 2000s, we saw multiple cores. Then we saw wider uh, SIMD. And then later on, we saw uh, many cores, right? which means uh, GPUs, etc. cetera. Uh, later on, heterogeneity. And mid 2010s, we saw started seeing uh, specialized units like uh, matrix multiplication units appear on the chips. Right? NVIDIA introduced tensor cores. Interestingly, some of these things were researched uh, long ago in the 90s. But then they came back as specialized units on more general purpose hardware. Right? So these are some of the trends that compilers also have to catch up with uh, in order to get best performance from the hardware. And a more recent trend has been the use of low precision compute. They realize that you don't need 64-bit floating point uh, operations you can do with 16-bit, 32-bit, or even less, 8-bit. And as a result, the architects are able to pack more and more you know, flops or operations per second, stera ops on the chip. And it is for compilers to sort of uh, uh, basically utilize these things well so that you can uh, basically get more performance, you can bring in and bring out data uh, much more uh, frequently, right? So uh, with that, now if you look at the other side, which is programming frameworks. Programming frameworks are evolving. People like programming in Python. Uh, Python-based frameworks are very popular, uh, provide a high level of abstraction. You don't have to even know anything about the GPU. For example, GPU uh, parallel programming, uh, uh, the parallel uh, parallelism hierarchy, etc. And as a result, uh, basically, uh, uh, as a result, uh, it, they, they're able to provide a high level of productivity. And so uh, compilers have to deal with that huge gap in abstraction between the programming frameworks and the uh, hardware. Right? Uh, and so if you again come back, say, LLVM was what was available uh, prior to uh, 2017 or 18. And, that, and so people had to build their own compiler intermediate representation. At that time, I was visiting Google and mainly looking at this combination of uh, uh, TensorFlow, uh, to TPUs and how do we actually build some reusable infrastructure that all AI frameworks can use and all chips can use and that can serve as some sort of a toolkit uh, to build new compilers. Right? Uh, it should be high level than LLVM. It should solve some of the problems people have had with LLVM. At the same time, it should borrow a good thing. Right? And that's when uh, the MLIR project started and it was open sourced in uh, 2019 and has seen a widespread uh, adoption. MLIR standing for multi-level intermediate representation provides you uh, various levels of abstraction so that you can solve the problem uh, in a specific, uh, uh, in a very convenient way. That is mapping to specialized AI hardware, doing a compilation for both Python-based framework as well as other framework. Right? And if you look at the bigger picture here, now we have uh, two sets of uh, uh, programming frameworks or languages. One are general purpose languages like C, C++, Rust, etc. It's important to continue to build compilers for those and improve those compilers. But there's only so much more performance uh, you will get. So it's like a very, evil it's very evolutionary. It takes a long time to get uh, some improvements, but it is also important. On the other side, we have a more domain-specific approach, which are abstracting away a lot of things from the programmers, uh, like uh, the specifications that I showed you. And then you don't have to know about the hardware. And the compilers actually do a lot of heavy lifting, uh, providing good uh, performance over there. Right. Uh, so with this, uh, I will, uh, with this sort of a motivation and introduction, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, it a compiler for AI that we built uh, at Polymage Labs, uh, and then, uh, but some of the principles apply in general to other AI compilers also. Uh, I will try to uh, emphasize what are the things uh, that a good AI compiler uh, should have, what are the things it needs to implement, uh, and uh, basically, if you don't, what kind of performance uh, you will lose, right? And so, it's just talking about Polyblocks. Polyblocks uh, is, again, a compiler engine. And that is from a startup at Polymage Labs. It's a deep tech startup incubated at the Indian Institute of Science. About four years of technology building that we've done over here. Right? And just like I said, okay, there's MLIR in between, but MLIR just provides you a toolkit to build compilers. Right? You have to build it yourself, depending on if you're a chip vendor 
you have to build your own compiler yourself. So Polyblocks is providing a layer on top of MLIR to build uh, compilers for uh, deep learning hardware and frameworks. And uh, this is how uh, it programming framework looks like. Right? So what you can do is this on the right side, you see a, uh, a TensorFlow uh, specification. And this has four or five operators. For example, it is uh, tf.reshape, uh, which is reshaping a tensor. There are a couple of uh, convolutions, tf.con2d. And this is what a programmer writes, and they can actually run this through the standard TensorFlow runtime. So what Polyblocks does is you just add an annotation on top, which says that JIT compile this through Polyblocks. That is, instead of running in eager mode or running with the existing TensorFlow compiler, this says just JIT compile with Polyblocks. So you don't have to change any uh, code over here, not, no additions or deletions, but just one line saying that I want to compile this and execute it on GPUs. Right? And if you run this, uh, here it is five times as fast as uh, the stock compiler that comes with uh, TensorFlow. Right? And, uh, and this is, these results are on a, a NVIDIA a A10, like a data center class uh, GPU. Right? And so here's what is happening under the hood. As I said, if you run it uh, through a, a non-compiled uh, execution engine, they will just make a call to a library for reshape, then another call to, to a library for convolution, uh, and so on. And what you get is a composition of the calls and you will get that many GPU kernels. However, Polyblocks has a way to fuse all of these operators in a specific way uh, where you create a single GPU kernel, right? So that fusion, right, uh, various compilers differ in their ability to uh, fuse, right? Some may fuse uh, way, right? So uh, that could lead to this difference in performance. Now, XLA is, is a compiler that is available with TensorFlow. So we are five times as fast as XLA which uh, yeah, basically even that is able to do a compilation, but here uh, the, really the difference is coming from how these two compilers actually fuse. XLA relies a lot of, uh, relies on a lot of handwritten libraries, but a Polyblocks does not, it's fully uh, auto-generated thing. So Polyblocks can provide a just-in-time compiler or even ahead of time, that is you can take this, you can compile it to a binary and then later on use it, right? So that is, uh, you can do uh, AOT, that's called ahead of time compilation, or you can do JIT compilation, that is you run this, and when this Python runs, right, the compiler comes in the first time, it will compile it and execute it. And subsequent calls to this function here, blur x, blur y, will just be calling the cached uh, compiled code. But this is how uh, compilers like Torch Inductor and uh, the XLA, they all work, right? You just, add to have, just need to have a single line added to say that compile, and they will give you better performance, right? So in that sense, the programmer has to do uh, barely anything. Right. So this is a little bit more uh, into the uh, design of the compiler. So any compiler that is based on MLIR uh, uses multiple levels of abstractions. The blue boxes here are dialects. And anything that is high up is using a higher level abstraction. So the box you see here is the entry point uh, into polyblocks from any of these frameworks. And this uh, polygon that you see is our compiler engine. Right? So polyblocks is a compiler engine. You can use it to build a compiler for PyTorch, TensorFlow, uh, JAX, any other programming framework also perhaps like MATLAB and other things, anything high level, as long as you can basically lower to this abstraction. So these boxes are what are called dialects in MLIR. So they are a bunch of operators or tensors. So think of MATML, convolution, these are all operators, right? So these are all operators in this dialect. So what the compiler does is through a bunch of passes, it will lower the level of abstraction from something high level to uh, something like uh, loops. And uh, basically, uh, over here, uh, you will go from a higher level abstraction to a mid-level abstraction, then uh, basically lower level abstraction, and finally through LLVM interface. And the, the things that are in bold is where a lot of the action happens in terms of compiler transformations like fusion, uh, tiling, uh, basically vectorization, uh, loop optimizations. That's where Polyblocks performs a lot of its uh, optimization. And it doesn't care, uh, this specific uh, engine does not care uh, where your code uh, comes from. It can come from JAX or PyTorch. The same set of optimizations are applied, right? The same set of passes are used, irrespective of what model you use. You could be using Llama or some convolutional neural network model, and uh, basically that's the performance uh, you actually uh, get, right? And it works for this entire cross product, like three cross three product. It supports NVIDIA GPUs, AMD GPUs, CPUs, and potentially uh, other chips also, uh, Polyblocks could be developed for but this whole three cross three and uh, nine paths, right, are supported by a single uh, compiler engine. Whereas in this space, uh, JAX and TensorFlow have their own compiler called XLA that I mentioned. Torch has a compiler called Torch Inductor, and they don't share any infrastructure beyond the lowest LLVM layer. 
Whereas we built something that can uh, basically reuse the same common optimization infrastructure across frameworks and across hardware. Right? So that's, uh, I would say, uh, maybe for a compiler to be successful and reusable, I think uh, the same set of optimization should be uh, used across these uh, different frameworks. Right? Uh, and the whole compiler is structured as uh, basically a pass pipeline. So we use about 150 to 200 passes at, at this stage right, to go from this box here to a low level dialect. So LLVM dialect is like has low level operations like add, mul, etc. But it goes through various abstractions like loops, then basic blocks and so on. And there are this many passes that apply transformations like fusion, tiling, um, whether it's mapping to tensor cores. For example, a lot of the uh, new hardware have instructions like being able to multiply 16 cross 16 matrices, right? That is like one uh, instruction load, uh, compute, etc. So uh, all of this have to be performed somewhere on this path, going from high to uh, lower level intrinsics. And uh, Polyblocks achieves this by uh, packaging these optimizations into different uh, passes. Right? Okay, so uh, with that, uh, I guess here we use all kinds of techniques. It's completely model driven in the sense there are cost models that drive these passes. And depending on the target information, if you say that your chip has about 128 kilobytes of storage, uh, and maybe some of the chip has two, so all of this information goes into the process and they do the right thing, right? depending on what the target info is and all kinds of greedy heuristics, some of the dynamic programming and all of the standard things that you might have learned in algorithms are used in uh, all of these uh, passes. Right? So there is uh, there are analytical cost models that are there. And the same cost models work for all kinds of uh, uh, basically uh, deep learning uh, AI models, the IR that comes in from uh, these arrows. right? And we use a lot of open source besides MLIR, we use a lot of community driven projects like Torch, Emler, et cetera, to uh, basically uh, lower the specific framework into MLIR first before applying further optimizations. Right? This is a long list of optimization, but I think these are the things that compilers should be able to do. Otherwise, there's going to be a huge gap in performance between handwritten code and compiled uh, code. And some of the, all of these transformations are what we call mid-level uh, transformations. Mid-level in the sense they are mostly applying to loops. High-level transformations will be things like uh, transpose plus something is you, you interchange those things where you are making use of the uh, basically the specific uh, knowledge of the operators. But if you perform transformation loops, we call them like mid-level transformation. So Polyblocks, the compiler toolkit provides all these transformations so that it's easy to build uh, basically a compiler for a new piece of hardware. Right? That's it. So especially fusion, tiling, being able to map to uh, specialized uh, MATML units or vector units, uh, performing redundant computation so that you can avoid global memory access is one of the key techniques being used by uh, several frameworks, including uh, XLA, et cetera. Right? Uh, and in that sense, you can use any infrastructure to implement this, but the whole point is that if you use MLIR, it makes it easy to implement all these transformations at the right place. Right? It's a more productive for the compiler uh, developer. Many of these things you might have studied in textbooks, uh, in compiler, uh, basically courses, especially styling. It's just that if you use the right abstraction or a high level or a mid level abstraction, uh, like in the MLR dialects, the, many of these optimizations become much more effective. LLVM also performs a lot of these things, but at a very low level. So you get limited mileage out of it. Whereas a polyblocks or any MLR based compiler is able to do a better job over uh, here. Right? But I, I think without these op optimizations, I think the compiled code is not going to beat uh, hand-tuned or uh, library uh, performance. And especially the fusion is something that is not possible with libraries. Right? So you've written a library for convolution of MATML, then you've written a library to do things like add, multiply. Think about the number of ways to compose all these operators. Right? And uh, as a result, you'll always make calls to libraries one after the other, whereas the compiler can generate code for the fused combination of these operators. And that is strictly a better than uh, basically using uh, libraries. And that's why I think the figure that I showed, why Torch inductor is able to get 2x, 5x performance over just eager mode of execution, it is because it's doing a fusion with the help of uh, OpenAI uh, Triton generating that code, and these fused kernels outperform libraries. Polyblocks has its own uh, fusion framework, which is more powerful, and that's why we are able to uh, get better performance. Right? So uh, in that sense, if you can see your Polymage and Polyblocks, Polyblocks can be used to uh, build new compilers. It can also be used to accelerate existing models on NVIDIA GPUs to uh, basically uh, run them faster than uh, whatever is possible through Torch Inductor. And ultimately here, I think if you're building a compiler, uh, a full compiler, right? Uh, 
the, the, our vision here is that it has to be fully automatic. That is, you don't want the compiler to map to libraries for some part of the code because then again, you suffer from the same limitations that the libraries had. But a lot of the compilers today, especially XLA and Torch Inductor, for a good part of the code, they're actually using handwritten libraries. Only for some of the code, they are able to generate fuse code. Whereas uh, on the other hand, Polyblocks, it's able to like every line of code that it generates is like fully automatic. And it should be built on an open source compiler infrastructure like MLIR so that uh, I think uh, the infrastructure has to be lasting so that people speak the same language. You are able to find compiler developers. Uh, and then uh, we really care about uh, big performance improvements, not just 20, 30% improvement, but for people to start using compilers and switch from these libraries. I, I think there's a significant amount of uh, improvement that's possible. And I, I think uh, compilers can uh, deliver that, right? And that will make them uh, appealing, right? And uh, obviously you want to also not invent a new language, but say that, okay, if you have an existing framework, by just adding this, just like OpenMP, by adding this extra annotation or an extra line, you're able to take the same thing and compile it now, right? Same results, but just uh, compiled uh, performance, right? That's the thing. Uh, here are some results with the uh, polyblocks and this uh, specific uh, chart is showing how important fusion of operators is. So a compiler like polyblocks, you can turn a switch and say that do not do fusion, apply all the remaining optimizations and then turn on fusion and see the difference, right? Uh, this actually shows that a lot of time is being spent on non-MATML uh, computations, right? MATMLs are accelerated through specialized units. However, uh, there's also a lot of other computation which is memory bandwidth bound. So there's own Amdahl's law, right? You go on speeding up MATMLs, ultimately your bottleneck is something else. Unless you start fusing that in, you will not see any speed up. So this chart here shows that if you were to turn off fusion, but still keep the other optimization, you're almost going to lose on average 2.5x to 3x of performance, right? So this basically means uh, you have to start optimizing across operators. It's not sufficient to just make one single thing go fast, but it has to be a, a combination. And similar results have been shown by Torch Inductor also, where if you read their paper, they'll say the disabled fusion and saw how much of the improvement was completely wiped off, right? Because uh, that's the benefit compilers are, are bringing, uh, fusion of operators in combination with other transformations, the single biggest uh, source of improvement over uh, libraries, right? So that's, uh... so again, uh, I think uh, one of the things we've used a lot in uh, uh, in polyblocks is the polyhedral abstraction, which is captured in a dialect called the affine dialect of MLIR, which has uh, basically special abstractions to represent uh, affine accesses, uh, regular uh, accesses with uh, where the access functions of the tensors are uh, affine functions. And that allows you to perform a lot of uh, complex transformations. Here you can see the arrows represent the dependencies, the dot uh, represents the computations. If you want to get some complex partitioning, such that I want to execute this tile and then execute this tile instead of trying to execute horizontally, this can be represented through uh, some combination of polyhedral transformations. Again, I, I won't go into the detail, but there's a framework called the polyhedral framework that allows you to express some complex combination of tiling and fusion optimizations so that you get better locality, you get better parallelism. And this is available in the MLIR's affine dialect abstractions and the other passes that are already there, right? And you can extend them and build uh, them to uh, perform some uh, transformations. Uh, these are all figures that describe uh, different kinds of uh, tilings uh, and different ways in which you can change the execution order. If you were to just execute row by row, you get some performance, you get parallelism, but you don't get locality. But if you take a small, piece, put it in the cache and go upwards first, uh, instead of going all the way sideways, uh, then you get cache locality and a parallelism. Okay, uh, here are some of the results. Uh, at this point, as far as polyblocks goes, uh, we have uh, basically, uh, uh, we are picking and choosing. Uh, these are the benchmarks where we get significant improvement. So this is the blue one is torch eager, which says how many inferences, so higher is better. Uh, this can give this kind of performance uh, with uh, inductor, you can get good improvement, but with polyblocks, which is another compiler, you can get even more, almost 1.5x to 2x improvement over the best compiler that is there today. Uh, Torch Inductor is from uh, Meta Facebook and uh, they are investing in uh, that compiler. But uh, if we do it the polyblocks way, it is even uh, better is what uh, this figure is showing. Uh, similarly, uh, these are all vision AI models, AlexNet, ShuffleNet, Inception, HRNet, uh, where with polyblocks, you can get a 1.5x to 2x speed up over the best compiler that is already there for PyTorch. And all of this difference is coming from uh, mostly uh, 
approach to fusion, approach to fusion and tiling and all the other optimizations that we are performing that are more effective than what uh, torch inductor is performing over here. Right? So uh, some models where we can see uh, uh, even up to 2.8x uh, improvement. Right? So this is where the other frameworks are relying on libraries. If the libraries don't perform well, then you're stuck with that uh, performance. There's nothing you can do because that is, libraries are often closed source. You may not be able to change them or even if it's open source, it's not clear how you should improve the library for this specific model. Whereas compiler is going to generate the right code for this specific model on its own. So as a result, you can do strictly uh, better, right? When I say this specific model, convolutions, matemals have certain sizes, right? You have M, N, and K, and library may have some number of versions, and they may give you some performance, but a code generator can generate the right code for those sizes, right? So because the code has been generated on demand on the fly. So that's where uh, you see uh, these benefits, right? Uh, with that, I can say the last point that I talked about, right? In the last four or five years, uh, hardware vendors have been able to go on improving the number of uh, operations per second flops or tera ops, because they're you know, using lower precision, right? And uh, which basically means, it, okay, to do inference, they can say that we can work with eight bit ints or even four bit ints. We don't need 16 bit floating point. And that's where the traditional HPC stagnated because a lot of the domains in traditional high performance computing, like, like weather forecast, computational fluid dynamics, they all rely on 64 bit floating point. And there is only so much innovation you can do, but by reducing uh, the precision, right? From 64, 32, 32, 16, you get almost that much increase in the peak compute performance. It also means you have to move less data, right? You, have to, you can move uh, uh, more elements for the same memory bandwidth because the precision has reduced. So you can go two times faster. You can bring in data two times faster. You can compute two times faster. So that is great. Right? And uh, the deep learning, uh, the AI domain has greatly benefited with this innovation in hardware, which means both libraries or compilers have to adapt to it to deliver that kind of performance improvement, right? So uh, here again, a good compiler that can handle quantization, which is basically using a less uh, uh, lower precision with these models, right? You should be able to perform all of those transformations. You should have like eight bit going into the chip and eight bit coming out of the chip. Okay, so uh, uh, with that, uh, I will uh, maybe show one more chart here showing how much benefit you can get from uh, basically uh, going from a higher to lower precision. Right? And I have a question here. So basically, this is comparing polyblocks with F16 versus int8, right? So if you switch from F16 to int8, how much performance are you getting? Ideally, you would expect 2x uh, improvement in performance if you were uh, to use lower precision. But remember that not all operators benefit from that uh, 2x. Uh, typically, convolutions, manual, you, that's the ideal speed up. However, in some cases, we also see more than uh, 2x. So that's something uh, interesting that I, I can discuss with you uh, offline. Uh, something to think about how you can get more than 2x by going from uh, uh, basically F16 to I8. But here we note that uh, with quantization, we're getting a good amount of speed up, almost 1.5x uh, improvement in performance without basically uh, with an acceptable loss in uh, accuracy, right? So that is a great improvement often to have uh, the same model and acceptable results, uh, whereas uh, you're able to exploit the lower precision that is available on the hardware. Okay, so uh, with this, I'm going to uh, conclude here and then I'll do a short uh, video uh, demo uh, showing some of these things uh, in action because otherwise compiler presentations often tend to be uh, boring, right? Unless you see uh, the, uh, the compiled code in action and how and why it's giving that improvement, right? So uh, I, I think, but in summary, you could say that the compilers for the AI domain are already here uh, I think Torch Inductor has shown uh, the kind of improvement you can get. And what this means is if you are someone who's building uh, a new AI chip or you're working in industry, uh, basically to build tools to program it, build compilers, I think you have to start thinking about compilers from uh, day zero. That is saying that the hardware is 2x better in performance or has a better uh, cost for ownership and so on is not sufficient. I mean, unless, you, unless the hardware is usable, unless you have built a good compiler, you are going to lose a lot of performance on the table. That is, you may be getting only 10% of the peak of the hardware, whereas 20, 40% might have been possible if you had the right compiler. So if you don't invest in software uh, and compilers uh, for the hardware from, from the start, uh, then uh, risk uh, uh, you risk losing a lot of performance. Uh, the hardware is going to be less usable by uh, other users. 
and uh, you have these uh, issues, right? Uh, and then obviously, even if you are not building new hardware and you want to accelerate models and data on whatever is the latest and greatest hardware, right? Uh, I think uh, before resorting to low-level programming like CUDA, you could try out compilers and then they could uh, sort of without, out of the box, they can give you a sort of good uh, performance, right? Uh, and then as a result, there is a tremendous, uh, basically, opportunity in research uh, and whatever in both academia and industry uh, as far... They would put their audience. Oh, I think uh, perhaps it's from the Google Meet. Huh? Okay, uh, so uh, that's... Uh, so there is a clearly a lot of opportunity there and uh, in terms of building a new compilers and here it is it can be about building new cost models so that the compiler does the right transformations uh, and that give good performance all kinds of uh, models and I said this is a never-ending process because uh, uh, the programmers want higher and higher levels of abstraction uh, they don't want to be worried about uh, low level detail on the hardware uh, and on the other hand the hardware is also evolving, becoming uh, more specialized, becoming heterogeneous, and uh, basically uh, the software stack has to sort of ad adapt so that it can exploit the hardware well. And it's been shown in many cases that uh, whenever these new models come out, they're only using a small fraction of what the hardware is capable of, like 5%, 10%, 20%. If you get like 50%, that itself is sort of very good. 50% of the peak performance, right? When they advertise 500 teraflops. And if you get 250 teraflops, that's uh, excellent. And, uh, but that is possible only for some patterns of computation. Uh, but then uh, often people, uh, programmers may not know how much they are losing. And uh, I think over here, uh, the software, right? Uh, there is a lot of opportunity in building automatic uh, tools to uh, sort of make sure that the hardware is exploited well and to cover the uh, gap, right? So uh, I think with this, uh, I would conclude uh, maybe the slides part of this presentation. Those who are on Google Meet, Unfortunately, we will not be able to see the video demo that I do over here, but then the video demo is also available uh, on, uh, if you go online to Polymage website and the LinkedIn handles, we have some of these things uh, showing the, compiled, uh, the compiler performance in action, but I'm going to do that locally on this uh, laptop over here, uh, and it's going to be running on the GPU that's on this laptop, so only those who are here in person uh, will be able to uh, sort of uh, see this, right? Uh, and uh, perhaps I'll just need five minutes uh, for the uh, video demo, right? And after that, uh, please feel free to uh, ask uh, questions. Is there a posit in any of these uh, experiments or, uh, you know, your uh, implementations? Uh, so could you repeat, uh, have I considered... Uh, have you considered a posit system for uh, implementation of these uh, uh, floating point operations? Uh, because that is supposed to give better performance for the same thing, whatever you are saying about in lower precision? So, uh, no, we have not uh, tried or in fact, I'm not aware of that system. The ones that I showed, the way uh, the performance uh, it was measured is the following, right? You have a model and this is basically what's called post-training quantization. So, the uh, basically, the non-quantized model has F16 or F32 weights and then with a few lines of uh, code, you basically uh, quantize that model. So let's say you're performing a convolution or MATML. So there'll be some point-wise operations which will uh, quantize from F16 to I8 and then perform the operations in I8 and then convert back from I32 to I8. So we did not use uh, that specific approach and I don't know how those uh, improvements will compare to uh, the ones that I showed. But here we're getting 1.5 to 2x kind of improvement by going from F16 to uh, I8. And here we're exploited because NVIDIA GPUs have uh, uh, matrix multiply instructions that operate on I8 and I32, right? And uh, they have F16 and F32, accumulated in F32 and F16. And so there's a specific workflow that each of these frameworks provides TensorFlow, PyTorch to perform the quantization. That is take your uh, model that is non-quantized and then uh, this is after all the training has happened and then basically uh, quantize it. But uh, that's something I may have to look at. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, that system. Okay. The posit is a, is a different uh, you know, uh, mathematical representation of floating point numbers. Okay. And uh, that automatically provides for lower precision, it provides higher performance and also higher precision. The errors okay. that uh, you encounter in floating point operations is minimized there or is non-existent to some extent. So automatically you don't have to do anything in your program, okay. you just automatically takes care of you know, all the things. That is the, uh, those are the observations so far in industry, but 
that is to be implemented fully that is why i asked whether you are aware of that uh no so i think correct as you say maybe it requires a hardware support and maybe a exact set yeah. of instructions it's to say that it is exactly okay. yeah. now new chips are uh, coming up with posit uh but uh, yeah so okay. that is that is one uh, one thing which is happening in a uh, no orthogonal uh, place yeah so. i see uh, no i think that is good that is transparent yes. to everything that we are doing and that's uh, correct if that works then that is uh, definitely good yes thank you yeah, thank you any more questions uh hello uh sir uh, when you say uh, polyblock fuses the mathematical operators how much role polyhedral techniques is to play in that uh, arrangement and is it central and if it's not central let's say if we keep aside polyhedral optimizations how much gains we achieve with just the fusing of operators ha huh, okay sure so uh, basically the few for the fusion we are using the uh, slicing based approach uh, available in the affine fusion pass uh, or affine fusion utilities in mlir so what this basically means is that we'll say if you want to fuse one operator with convolution with a uh, basically another operator we'll say to uh, generate uh, to compute this slice what other who else is producing uh, the results that are needed by this and we'll pull in all of those producers into this consumer right so matmal is computing let's say it's computing on uh, multiplying these two things we'll go in the graph and check from here if i want this slice of the input uh, what slice of that i need to pull in and you keep pulling in things uh, and that's sort of the pull uh, approach and this affine slicing based approach uses some polyhedral abstractions it will chase the access function and find it okay uh, if you want this box then i need uh, this part of the other computation to be computed and then you pull it so, so you tile this and then you pull in things that you uh, need uh, and this one uh, the figure that i showed you earlier uh, over here uh, says if you were to just disable fusion over here right uh, this is the amount of performance you will lose but maybe if your question was if you do not use a polyhedral fusion techniques and do simple fusion but that's what torch inductor does and that's what xla and they are very good at doing that they do not use this polyhedral affine slicing based approach but they do still simple fusion which a lot of deep learning compilers do which is like point wise point wise operations you have add and then you have multiply you can fuse it together so this is this basic fusion that a lot of frameworks do but uh, that's the difference between torch inductor and polyblocks when you see uh, over here uh, a good amount of that benefit is coming from fusion we are also doing other things maybe more efficiently but uh, how we fuse uh, we are able to fuse perhaps more and especially this 5x improvement that i showed over here is coming from that if you don't do polyhedral fusion here almost no framework not even torch inductor xla is able to fuse across these two convolutions uh, but you need a more advanced technique uh, to do that so in several cases your fusion will be limited if you don't use polyhedral techniques if you use more traditional uh, rule based approaches like point wise point wise like they are also able to fuse matmul and other operators but again limited your mileage is limited and if you have a more powerful compiler then you can do uh, i think fusion in a better uh, way so that's where the difference between these different compilers like xla uh, torch inductor is coming from uh, basically how powerful their or how good their heuristics are to uh, fuse so that's so i think with that I, i'll show uh, this part of the demo because it is still 5 uh, minutes so here we are showing a uh, object detection is a state of the art transformer based model it's called the ditter this is the original image you can see uh, cars moving and all of that and object detection is extremely important so you can see it's a very accurate it's finding over here are the cars and here are the traffic lights the number you see is the uh, basically the probability now this is a model that was developed by the facebook uh, research team uh, meta right and if you just use torch eager right on the cpu it takes almost the model is so compute heavy it's taking 860 or 830 milliseconds to process each frame on this laptop if you right so that is an interesting uh, thing right that's where high performance computing comes in people don't use these expensive models because often uh, they are not providing that real time response right you want to do 25 frames per second or you want to detect something within 100 milliseconds and things like that right uh, and that you will not get unless things are optimized now this is with the polyblocks on the right you can get 50 milliseconds per frame on the same thing so no difference in results right this is torch eager on cpu now i am not showing torch on gpus because the pytorch inductor and eager both crash uh, while trying to execute this on the gpu we couldn't figure out why they were uh, crashing 
So, uh, but then the benefit you get, same specification, no change to the code, you just say JIT compile with polyblocks and uh, it is uh, 63 milliseconds per frame, about uh, 12 times faster, right? This may still not be fast enough if we want like a higher resolution and this is running on uh, I think almost uh, close to full HD uh, thing, but this actually shows uh, if you want high accuracy, you may have to use a complex uh, deep, it's big AI models, right? Uh, this is a convolution plus transformer based uh, uh, model. And uh, if you use this, the latency to process each frame is quite high. Then again, you need to use HPC, whether it's libraries or compilers to speed it up. And uh, with that, uh, you are able to meet uh, some uh, objectives, right? So that's, and completely, uh, the, the automatic system takes care of all this uh, code generation, right? So that's, uh, there are some more models that we have uh, for them. Here, this is con next, it just does object detection and you can see uh, here it says what kind of object and here below it shows the uh, confidence level. And uh, this is with PyTorch CPU, with polyblocks again, it's going to take some time. First frame, it's going to call the compiler to compile it. Second frame onwards, it will use the compiled uh, code, right? So that uh, first time you have that uh, lag for, for the compilation. In all these cases, we are able to compile these models in anywhere like 10, 20 seconds, right? So now it is polyblocks, 20 milliseconds per frame, uh, whereas this was uh, uh, eager on CPU was 50 milliseconds per frame.